We continue in our sermon series this morning, Flesh It Out. We're actually wrapping this up. We've spent the last couple of weeks considering how the good news of the Christmas story, that God became incarnate, one of us, um, what that means to us in our daily life and how that then um, grew from Christ's birth all the way through his earthly ministry. So last week we talked about Christ's baptism and our own, and this week we will consider what it means to say that when Jesus walked the earth, um, he healed and how that healing continues to be offered to us today. So as we prepare to hear the sermon, I'd invite you to take your GPS out. That's our guide for prayer and study that you should have been handed when you came in the door. On one side of that, you'll see the sermon information for today and some blank space for you to take notes um, as God raises things up in you as we hear the sermon. And then on the flip side of that, you will find a scripture reading and a prayer tip for each day of the coming week. And so this is the way one way that we are able to stay connected to God through prayer and study from Sunday to Sunday. So we hope you will make use of that tool throughout the week as well. So our scripture this morning is going to come from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Hear these words. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They they said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. As we prepare to hear a message from this scripture passage, I invite you to pray with me. Holy and Almighty God, we give thanks for the opportunity to gather as your people this morning for this place where you meet us. We give thanks that you always answer when we call to you, that you speak to us through our scriptures again and again, helping us to draw nearer to you. We pray that as you do that this morning, our hearts and our minds might be open to hear the message that you've crafted for each of us. God, I pray that these words would be your words, this message, a demonstration of your spirit's power and nothing of my own. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. So my family and I were watching the tail end of America's Got Talent earlier this week. And our older children, our two boys, were very fascinated by a magician who was on the show. Because he had, through the course of his act, been able to seemingly predict which cards the judges would take off of a board he had for them, and then somehow to magically trade places with another magician. And as I watched that, I thought, magic is kind of an interesting form of entertainment because that's what it's for, right? We watch magic to be entertained, to be like our boys, totally enthralled, except we have already decided that we're going to let them fool us, right? We know that they're doing something, sleight of hand or an illusion. We know that it's not real magic, but that it's meant to entertain us to see if they can get one by us. And so we gather for things like magicians, and crowds gather for them, and we're entertained by them, and that's interesting to see how they work. But as I thought about that, and I'm looking at a healing passage for our scripture this morning, I thought, I wonder if sometimes we slide into thinking of Jesus' miracles as like magic tricks. Like that the point of the miracle was just in that moment to draw a crowd, to entertain them, to make them ooh and awe. When the reality is that the miracles had a greater purpose. 
not only for the people who were experiencing them, whether that be healing or the seemingly magical multiplication of fish and loaves, but also for the greater good news of the gospel. And so our story this morning is in the Gospel of John, which scholars divide into two parts. The first half of the Gospel is known as the Book of Signs. The second half of the Gospel is known as the Book of Glory. The first half of the Gospel is known as the Book of Signs because it contains all of these moments in Jesus' ministry, these miracles and healings, like turning water to wine at the wedding at Cana, um, having the blind man we just read about experience healing, healing a crippled um, beggar. So there's all these moments where Jesus has miraculous either experiences or healings going on, and they're not magic tricks. The book of signs tells us they're about more than drawing a crowd, that the point of them is to glorify God. The point of Jesus's healing is to glorify God. Okay, so that's right there in our scripture passage that we heard read. Verse 3 says this, Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So I have to take a moment and step up on a soapbox, if you will, about this particular verse of Scripture. So kind of the way it's written in our English translations makes it sound like God is saying, I had this person be born blind so that at some point in his adulthood life, Jesus can come along and heal him and have a magic trick moment where everybody can then see who Jesus really is. But that would be an awful thing because to be blind in his community would mean to basically be unable to hardly fend for yourself, to be pushed to the margins. So that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't sound like our God. But here's the thing. What we have in our English Bibles is not how it started out. And so I want to share with you a little bit about how we get to what we read when we go to study our scripture each and every day. And then you can see how we might be able to move some things around and make this passage make a little more sense for the book of signs. So I have a slide to show you. This is what manuscripts look like when scholars first start with them to make up the Greek New Testament. So you can see on this slide that you have all capital letters, No breaks for sentences, no breaks for punctuation. It's just words upon words upon words strung together. And so this is what the scholars start with, and they compile this into what we call a Greek New Testament, where they insert punctuation marks, they decide where sentence breaks are going to be, and then they take that Greek New Testament and translate it into English, which is what we are reading when we go to our Bibles in our world. So... Here's the thing. People have to make decisions. Now, there's structure in the Greek language that helps them to know kind of how the sentences should fall, where they should start um, and end. But there's also some interpretive moves happening. And so in verse 3, I think that we can do something a little different. And this came from my New Testament professor in seminary who taught me this, and I happen to agree with her. First, you should know that in the manuscripts and in the Greek New Testament, unlike in our English Bibles, in verse 3, the phrase, he was born blind, doesn't exist. So in the Greek New Testament, it reads like this, Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. So that God's works might be revealed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. And so if we take that phrase out that the English translators have put in and we move the period that's in the middle of that sentence in verse 3 and 4 and we put them together, which we can do because that's the way they are in the manuscripts, it reads a little differently. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, period. He's born blind, but it's not because of his sin and it's not because of his parents' sin. He was just born blind, no one has sinned, period. So that God's works might be revealed in him, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So that God can be glorified, so that God's kingdom can be revealed, so that we can have this moment of glory, we will offer this moment of healing. You see, it's not the man being born blind so that God is glorified, it's that Jesus heals so that God can be glorified. So this is what we have before us. This moment with this man receiving healing for the glory of God. 
And here's what we can learn from the blind man from the chapter 9 of the Gospel of John, which is that he has to trust Jesus at some point with his woundedness and then follow Jesus when Jesus tells him what to do. So I would imagine, we don't see it in the exchange as it's recorded here, that Jesus probably prompted some way before he just slapped spit mud on a guy's face. Right? I'm pretty sure he probably asked, may I offer you healing? Do you trust me? Will you allow me to do this? There was probably some exchange between Jesus and this man. So at some point he has to say, yes, I will trust you with this part of me and submit himself to what Jesus would do. And so Jesus makes the mud and puts it on his face, and then he tells him, now you have to go and wash to receive your sight. And so not only does he have to trust Jesus with his wounds, but he has to follow where Jesus calls him to go. And so he does, and he goes and he receives his sight. So when we look at how we can receive healing from our God, the first thing we have to do is trust God with our wounds, And then follow where God calls us in our healing. So what wounds do we have to offer to our God this morning? Some of us may have physical wounds, and sometimes we might see healing of those. But more often than not, the healing I hear about in the faith community is more internal. So maybe we have pain, internal pain, to offer as our wounds this morning. Perhaps we have grief over loss, to offer as our wound this morning. Maybe it's some sinful behavior that we're struggling with. Perhaps it's greed or arrogance or pride that we have to offer as our wound to our God this morning. Maybe it is regret or shame. What is it that you walked in this morning carrying that is wounding you that you can hand over and trust Jesus with? And then will we follow when Jesus calls to us to go? The story tells us that once this man does this, he does hear Jesus. He does trust Jesus with his woundedness. He does go to wash. He receives his sight. And the story tells us that when he comes back home, no one recognizes him. People keep asking him, are you that guy? Surely you're not that guy. And you kind of look like him, but no, it can't be you. Because when we receive healing from our God, we are fundamentally changed. Made new again. Gifted abundant life. We live with a different hope. When I think about this moment that he must have experienced being blind his whole life until right now when he washes in the pool and then he looks up, can you imagine everything coming into focus for the first time? How overwhelming that must have been. And so he must have walked back home a new man with literally new sight in the world. Of course no one recognized him. And he kept saying, it's me. And Jesus did this for me. Chapter 9 in the gospel is linked with chapter 10. In chapter 10 we get the very familiar good shepherd verses where Jesus says he's the good shepherd. And the verse, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And see, he says that the Sheep follow the shepherd. They hear the shepherd's voice. They trust the shepherd and they follow him. And so the blind man who receives his sight has this moment of healing with Jesus is doing what the sheep are called to do, which is what we are called to do, to trust and to follow. And then when we receive healing, it fundamentally changes who we are. There's a little bit more to the story than what I read at the beginning, so I want to kind of recap for you what keeps happening to this guy. So he comes into his neighborhood, and everybody's like, who are you? Surely you're not that guy. Yes, I am. It's me. Well, how are you seeing again? Jesus made mud, put it on my face, told me to go wash in the pool. I did, and I got my sight. And so the townspeople are like really confused. How is this crazy rabbi from out of town who seems to break rules able to heal somebody that's been born blind? It doesn't line up with their worldview. So they take him to the religious leaders of their community and they say, look, something's going on. This guy was born blind and now he can see. And so the religious leaders of their community say, 
were you born blind? Yes. How did you receive your sight? And he says, well, this guy Jesus came and he made mud and he put it on my face and he told me to go to the pool and to wash. And so I did. And now I can see. And he keeps getting asked to tell this story over and over again. And every time he tells it, his testimony gets stronger and his faith gets deeper so that by the end of it, when they're asking him for like the fifth time, he says, you know what? Yes, Jesus did this and I believe he is a prophet from God. So he just keeps pointing back. Fundamentally changed, willing to say who he is and pointing everyone back to Jesus. But in that exchange, his parents are brought in. And they're asked, is this your son? And they say, yes. And they're asked, was he born blind? And they say, yes. And they're asked, how did he receive his sight? And they say, we don't know. We don't know. Ask him. He's an adult. He can speak for himself. We don't know how it happened. Because the truth is, even when we're fundamentally changed by healing from God, a lot of times we want to hide our, the source of our healing because we don't want to bear our wound out in the world again. Or when we see healing in the lives of other people, maybe we dismiss it like so many of the townspeople did. Like, oh, that can't be God. Must have been luck. Must have been something else. So this man stays with it and keeps pointing to Jesus even when the people around him won't. And even when it means risking everything he just had. I don't blame his parents. Think about what he was risking by saying, yes, that was me. I was born blind. And not only that, but this rabbi that you don't know that you're too sure about is the one who gave me healing. Here's what he's risking. He's been marginalized his whole life for being blind. He's risking this opportunity to be reintegrated into, into the community His parents know that. They're scared he's going to be ostracized again for aligning himself with this rabbi. Think about what he could have done. He didn't have to point to Jesus. When he got his sight, he could have come back into town and when people said, surely that's not you, you're not that guy, right? Nope. And he could have been in his community with all the privileges of seeing people. He could have never gone back home. He could have gotten his sight and went to a neighboring town and started life over again where nobody knew that he used to be blind, where he could just be a regular old seeing person. He didn't have to bear his wound, but he did. He came and he used his healed wound to glorify God, to point back to Jesus. And he risked a lot to do it. And so the question for us then moves from what wounds do we have that we need to trust Jesus with this morning and then follow where he calls us to go in our healing, but that when we receive that healing, that fundamentally changes us. Well, we have the courage and conviction like this man to bear that healed wound out in the world so that it might glorify God, so that it might become a beacon of hope for another person who doesn't yet know what it means to be healed by our Lord. Or will we say, I don't know, or pretend it came from somewhere else? You know, in chapter 10, we hear about abundant life. And the truth is, this man who received this healing from Jesus, he knew what abundant life was. And he was going to keep glorifying God because he had peace that passed understanding. And he knew no matter what the world could throw at him, he was going to be okay because the good shepherd always cares for his sheep. So we can take our healed wounds and let them glorify God and experience real abundant life. You know, when I think about who have I met in my life who has done this really well, like this man in chapter 9, has received healing for something and then been able to bear that healed wound out in the world as a testimony to the glory of God, I think about a man named Carlos. For the last several years, I've had the privilege of traveling with Living Water International to Central America to drill clean water wells. And the way that organization is set up is each country has a person that's local to the country who um, runs all of the things going on in their country related to living water. And so in El Salvador, that person is Carlos. 
And this is usually the person when your team arrives that meets you at the airport and kind of gets you oriented on your first night there so you know what to expect in the coming week. And they usually tell a story of how they got to be in their position um, in Living Water. And a lot of them, most of them start out either uh, on drilling teams or hygiene teams, leading the people who come to visit and then kind of work their way up through the organization. And indeed, that's what Carlos did. But he told us all of his story that night. He told us about how when he was young, he had crossed into the U.S. illegally. He had gotten involved with some gangs and drug activity. He had been caught and deported and was no longer allowed to come back to the United States. But that when he got to El Salvador, he didn't really know what he was going to do. And he was trying to get his life together. He struggled a bit more there. But there was God always knocking at his door through this woman that he knew. And so finally one day he went to church. And then as his faith was born, he found living water, and he started working with them, and now he's worked his way up, and he receives teams all year long. And he tells them this story, and here's why I think it's important. Here's why I have learned from Carlos, because he didn't know us. He didn't know what we would think about him when he shared that wound and how God had healed it. He didn't know if we would receive him well or if we would now be leery of him, but he didn't care. Because he was interested in glorifying God. And that's what he does again and again and again. He bears that wound out to show people, here is how God has healed me. Glory be to God. What can I do to bring hope to others in the world? And then he gets to go and bring clean water and the good news of Jesus Christ to people in his country day after day after day. I can think of no person that I have met who more resembles the man in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, than Carlos. So what wounds did you walk in with this morning? And are you ready to trust Jesus with them? To follow where his voice calls you? To receive healing that will fundamentally change you? And then to reveal that healing out in the world as a beacon of hope for others? so that God might be glorified. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we give thanks for your healing in our lives. God, for the way that you come into our darkest places, the places where we have the most fear or anger, shame or resentment, and you bring light there bring resurrection. God, we pray that we might be courageous and convicted like the man we read about in our scripture this morning, that we might trust you, follow you, and then point everything back to you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.